Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have Steve Luby. He's a professor of medicine and infectious diseases and a Senior Fellow at the Woods Institute and the Freeman Spogli Institute, and uh, is a professor as well. And all this is happening at uh, Stanford. So, Steve, thanks for coming. Thanks, Richard. Happy to be here. Yeah, I don't know if your uh, if your work has been co opted by by COVID nineteen, but uh, what's your what's been your typical research, and then has it changed? What is it now? I'm a communicable disease epidemiologist, so that means that I look at the uh, transmission of infectious agents in communities. And we do this to try to figure out where we can intervene and make a difference. Um, my career is a little different in that I have spent a lot of time actually living in low-income countries. I lived in Pakistan for five years and Bangladesh for eight years. So I spent a lot of time um, there trying to figure out what's going on. Huh. What, what's it like in uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh? I know there's two different places, but they're certainly not the U.S. Is it the uh... You know, I'm sure our perception here is very different from what it's like to actually live there. Yeah, um, from the perspective of a communicable disease epidemiologist, these places are notable for their high population density, high levels of poverty, and particularly in Bangladesh, a lot of contact with domestic and wild animals. So those all increase um, the risk for emerging infections. Um, I would say personally, these are extremely warm and hospitable cultures, um, old cultures um, and places where we have many friends. Excellent. Hmm. So um, was your focus particularly geographies or is it any disease that would come up in these populations or has it now, you know, have you focused in on certain diseases that are, you know, prevalent and reemerging? Yeah, so um, my approach has been to go to where there were problems and then be and then sort of sort out um, what we should work on and where were the opportunities to make a difference. So a lot of the early, my early work in Pakistan was focused on hepatitis C transmission from unsafe injections. When I was in Bangladesh, I was deputed from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, and I was working particularly on concerns with emerging infections. So concerns with coronavirus, but most of my efforts were looking at influenza and at a particular virus, Nipah virus, that represents a pandemic risk. So uh, are there commonalities, you know, when uh, a population is affected by, you know, a virus or, you know, a different kind of virus or, you know, a bacteria, is the situation typically very similar or are they completely different depending on what's affecting a population? Yeah, well, there are different patterns and it depends both as you suggested on the pathogen, what is this particular pathogen and what's its mechanism of transmission and also in the particular place. For example, um, SARS coronavirus 2 is playing out very differently in the U.S. than it is in South Asia. In South Asia, in Bangladesh, it's the most densely populated country in the world. The, um, it has half the population of the U.S. in a country that is the size of the state of Iowa. So there are over 1,100 wow. people per square kilometer. There is no way you can social distance in Bangladesh. It just cannot happen. So um, the COVID-19 outbreak is just um, going through this country uh, like a tidal wave. Um, and there's no, there's not the level of health care or the health care facilities to deal with it. This is tragic in the short term. On the other hand, it means that this will run through those populations fairly quickly and leave very few susceptibles. So in fact, life is likely to normalize sooner in Bangladesh than it will in the U.S. or other high-income countries, which have been successful in not um, in preventing the virus from running through all of the populations, but leaving a large proportion of the population still at risk. 
what's an example of you know none of them have had it that long but what's an example of a place that it's incredibly dense um they've just let the virus run its course you know meaning SARS-CoV-2 and they've had it for the longest out of most of the countries is that Bangladesh where would that be no I think that in general the countries that are least able to respond with a with a lockdown or because of these high population densities are not particularly connected to global commerce. So one of the reasons why it went to Europe and US first was because those are globally connected cities. So I think what we're seeing is only now in South Asia and in some sub-Saharan African countries, we are beginning to see this roll through these areas. Um, But we're still in early days compared to um, Italy or the US. Oh, so there's no example country where um, it's just it's run its course and we know what the course looks like. Is that nope. we don't have that data yet? Nope. Nope. And that's part of what makes um, epidemiology um, interesting is that we don't always know. And we've been this is a new virus and we've been um, puzzling about how this will go. But uh, no. So so we don't have a roadmap. Hmm. OK. I mean, maybe we have a roadmap historically in measles. Measles um, is the most infectious virus of any. Um, if introduced into a native pop into an into a susceptible population, every person will infect on average eighteen other people. So it quickly runs through island populations, quickly runs through these settings, and we know this from history. Um, this is all prior to the development of immunization. So we know that this can happen, but um, SARS-CoV-2 is not as efficiently transmitted as measles, but on the other hand, the high population density in many of these countries and in the slums in the cities and the intergenerational households means that this will spread um, quite efficiently. What other lessons have uh, been learned from your work in observing, you know, these infectious diseases for so long? You know, there are responses that are thought appropriate but are not and vice versa. Yeah, I mean, I I think that a struggle that all that whenever we have an outbreak, it's always a chaotic situation. And so governments are often motivated to do something. So they want to do something, but those actions are not always ideally informed. For example, this rush to lockdown in low income countries has really exacerbated the financial impacts on these populations. And these are populations, most of whom are earning their living from the informal economy. So if they don't have a job, they don't eat. So the government of India, for example, made a decision within hours and said, no, we're going to lock down, toughest lockdown in the, country, in the world. Yeah. Yet um, most people then didn't have a way to earn a living, didn't have a way to um, secure food. The estimates are that by shutting down their immunization program, by shutting down their tuberculosis treatment program, by shutting down their HIV program, they're actually generating many more deaths than they are saving lives. So I I think there's this rush to action and also the sense that politicians want to do something. So I think at that point, it becomes really important to have sound um, scientific support in good in good conversation with leadership so that the decisions made can result in lives saved. Yeah, it seems like with, uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2, it's just like a monkey see monkey do. And it seemed like a big power grab for politicians around the world that don't, you know, could care less about their people. They're just uh, locking them up and then seeing what they could do to maintain their grip. Yeah, there have been some pretty discouraging examples, but let's talk about some uh, some good examples. Um, in Malawi, um, which is a very poor country in sub-Saharan Africa, they ran an analysis on what it would mean to shut down the country. And their quick assessment was that the costs of shutting down the country would exceed the benefits by a factor of 25 to 1 because of all these problems with subsequent malnutrition and um, lost health services. So they made the courageous decision not to follow the crowd and to say, no, um, we're going to stay open and and we're going to ride this way. So I I think they're an excellent example. Uh, Yeah, Yeah, 
I mean, at the other end, you look at Singapore. Singapore certainly had problems controlling their ongoing outbreak, but they've been very public with their information and very public with their decision making and um, very aggressive in terms of their active public health response. And because of that, they've really continued to get good support from their populace. So we do have good examples out there as well. Well, now that we can see some countries that have locked down, some that haven't, I mean, there's the... I don't know what you call it. What would you call it where there's a surge, let's say, in tuberculosis, um, you know, due to the lockdown, but it's uh, completely, it's, you know, it's a byproduct of doing the lockdown, but it wasn't, it wasn't direct. What would you call that? Is there a yeah, we call that. that- yeah, we call that an unintended consequence. And, okay, I don't know if there's a fancier word. So. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, and our actions often have unintended consequences. One of the um, disappointing characteristics of epidemiology is we often don't generate all the real-time data that provide definitive advice. We're often uh, have less information than we would like to inform decisions. And so like these measurements of unintended consequences, we'll have real clarity on what the best thing to do was in about two or three years after all of this has happened, we have the data and can exhaustively analyze it. And on the one hand, that's fine for chronic diseases that hang around for a long time. In these emergency outbreaks, it's pretty frustrating not to have the best available information and really having to make information based on incomplete data and uh, and based on historical examples. Though I will say it's not too different from being a clinical physician when you're faced with a sick patient and you're not real sure what's going on and you have to make life and death decisions based on incomplete information. So there's a comparison about the individual patient management and on the societal level that I find quite apt. Well, what are some of the uh, lessons learned, you think, from this, uh, this outbreak, this epidemic? Well, I would say one, th- um, I, I, think, I think there have been many lessons. We communicable epidemiologists have long argued that we are so connected that it will be impossible to stop an efficient respiratory transmitted pathogen. And this has you know, not really been taken seriously. This has fallen on deaf ears and people rush to, wait a minute, we're going to stop airline travel. But we are so connected. There are so many people shifting all the time. You can't stop a respiratory virus by closing down borders. We can't possibly move quickly enough. So I think the nature of our interconnectedness and this vulnerability has been laid bare. So as we think in the future about the subsequent pandemics and some of our biggest concerns is pandemics created by malicious actors. I think that this forces us to think about countermeasures somewhat differently, that the approaches that might have worked for plague in the Middle Ages in terms of quarantine and keeping people away are not something that works when we have such an intensely um, interactive, densely connected economy. Yeah, have you studied what's what's happened with these recent lockdowns? Like, you know, I, I remember watching, you know, Italy early on and the numbers and the numbers uh, seem to be completely unaffected by the lockdowns. So, I mean, I don't know. Does, what's the, what's the, uh, the consensus now? Did the lockdowns work? Did they not work? Or is it still going to be years before we know? No, I think we have some clear examples of when lockdowns worked. Um, the, we, we, uh, we have good data from China, and there are many people who cast dispersions on all Chinese data. But um, there have been good data coming out from China that certainly persuade me that their draconian efforts at lockdown did stop transmission of the virus. If you look at what happened in California state and in Washington state, there were some of the earliest places to put in lockdowns. They clearly have um, experienced many fewer cases. They didn't get the surges that overwhelmed their healthcare centers, and they altered the trajectory um, of the epidemic. So I'm not saying that every lockdown everywhere benefited. There is a lot of heterogeneity, but um, 
the more aggressive measures we do see evidence of some success. On the other hand, there remain really tough issues in terms of we don't have a definitive solution in hand and likely one is quite a while away. I certainly don't predict anything till um, the end of 2021 at the earliest. Um, so this has been such a devastating impact on the economy, certainly seeing this in low income countries, but seeing it in our own country and in um, other high income countries as well. And the absence of a functioning economy has a devastating impact on population health. So it's not clear how we should optimize how much lockdown and what we can do to also get people um, back to work and earning an income. Tough situations, tough decisions. Well, I don't understand how lockdown is supposed to help if, uh, you know, without a vaccine, which is not going to happen, I mean, you have to go for herd immunity. So lockdowns doesn't seem to really do anything. All it does is delay the inevitable, it seems like. Well, I think the one argument for lockdowns is that it prevents your healthcare system from being overwhelmed. Um, because if it just runs through, you're only going to be able to to treat a proportion of people who are infected. And if we can put this off, we also have the opportunity to uh, do more research. And for example, we now have a drug, remdesivir, which reduces um, the amount of time in hospital and likely improves survival. Those differences weren't statistically significant, but that's also because they stopped the study early because of the findings of um, shortening hospitalization. So we is con so the longer time science has to gain an understanding um, about this, then the more likely it is that we'll be able to deploy these tools. So the thinking is that um, then that um, ultimately we will be able to decrease impact on population because our systems won't be overwhelmed and we'll have better treatment. But you're right. I mean, there's a trade-off in that, um, what does this mean um, amongst people who are middle-aged or elderly and are still being, uh, and are susceptible with a virus that's continuing to circulate? It's not a uncomfortable um, situation. Do you think that uh, the coronavirus is going away? It seems like it's going to be a permanent fixture now. I would not expect it to go away. This is well adapted. This has demonstrated that it's well adapted to humans. There have been, there are already other human adapted coronaviruses that persist. Two of the causes of the common cold are, um, are coronaviruses. So I think this is going to be with us. I don't expect it to go away. Um, yeah. Right. So, what happens when air travel resumes? Now you have maybe, uh, you know, viruses, the coronavirus has taken different paths in different countries. You haven't been exposed to it. You're naive to it. Now you travel to some other country after six months of no travel. Now maybe that's far worse for you. Yeah, it's, um, I, I think that mixing will continue to represent a risk as long as there is a large population of susceptibles um, and as long as the virus continues to transmit. You might argue that going to Bangladesh would be the safest place to go if you're a susceptible person because you would be protected by the herd immunity of everyone else who's been infected. And in fact, high income countries that have effectively um, locked down might be the higher risk places. I think the, um, the intermediate goal is to develop an effective vaccine because an effective vaccine could take people who, have, who are susceptible and transition them to being protected. And that clearly is the process that would allow us to reopen the economy. The problem is, is that the timeline for vaccines uh, are longer than we, than, this, than, than the economic situation, than our economy, I would say, calls for. There's no guarantee it'll even work. I mean, some conditions, there's nothing, you know, HIV, 30 some years, nothing. You know, there's right. a lot of diseases, which is nothing. Right. Um, so, so that's an important question is, do we think coronavirus is vaccine preventable? Um, there are two um, veterinary vaccines for a coronavirus that affects um, 
pigs. And that's important if you're a pig raiser because they have high mortality in pigs. And the vaccines have been demonstrated in good randomized control trials to be effective. So this suggests to me that we're not dealing with a scenario like HIV or malaria, where we have a really hard time um, with a vaccine candidate. So I don't think this is going to end up being a um, disease that we cannot vaccinate with. There's also considerable effort. There are over 80 vaccine candidates that are being investigated. Um, I think the big problem is that it takes a long time to figure out what is safe, to get something pure enough that you can actually work with it in people, and to go through the process of doing good studies to convince us, um, to convince scientific and public health authorities that it's reasonable to give such a new um, product to millions or billions of people. Uh, and then even if you know that it's safe, ramping up manufacturing is yet another issue. So the typical timeline to develop vaccines um, in the commercial sectors on the order of 15 years, I think in this emergency, we can do it faster, but we're not going to do it um, in 15 weeks. I mean, it just can't be done. Yeah, faster. I mean, that sounds like five years would be a major speed up versus 15. But yeah, I, I mean, so. yeah, yeah. I mean, so th that's why I say, in, to my mind, the end of 2021 is best case scenario. Hmm. Do you think there's going to be, I mean, you know, there really hasn't been this reaction that I've known of before to, uh, you know, to a condition like this. And meanwhile, other conditions are ignored. Do you think that, uh, again, there's going to be any lessons learned from this or is this going to be the new way whenever there's a, uh, you know, a disease to, to go to this extreme? Well, this is a problem that we have as a society, that it's much easier for us to focus on what is immediately in front of us rather than what are viewed as low probability, but very high impact events. If you would have interviewed communicable disease epidemiologists five years ago and said, what do you think is the most likely global pandemic that would kill a million people or more, I would predict that the majority would have um, suggested influenza. Influenza has done it before, and there um, was a huge pandemic in, at the end of World War I, 1918 and 1919. And that's been where a lot of thinking has focused. Uh, certainly, coronavirus was seen as a risk, and coronavirus vaccine development was being pursued by the Coalition on Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation. So there was a sense that we needed to work on coronaviruses. Um, but, uh, but that work, the work on a coronavirus vaccine, only got started after the Ebola outbreak. After the Ebola outbreak, there was this sense of what do we have to do? Wait until it blows up in our face? Because if it blows up in our face, we don't have the time to develop. So there has been a group of forward-thinking funders who have said we should invest in developing vaccines against agents that have potential to create global devastating pandemics. And that's one of the reasons why we have some good candidates for the coronavirus vaccines. And this is a group that also has been um, supporting um, some of the work that I've been involved in on um, developing vaccines against Nipah virus. So I think you're right. It's not on the forefront of politicians' minds. And there's a lot of philanthropic money that has gone in to do this. But I, it is crucial for humanity's long-term survival, that we work on things other than what's just in the news today. We need to think about long-term threats, including threats that individually look like low probability, but they have such a high impact that we need to dedicate time and effort and scientific focus to learn more about them. So what, um, I don't know, what's, what do you think is gonna happen over the next year in terms of uh, coronavirus and in terms of, you know, epidemiology in general, any major changes or is it just going to take multiple years for anything to be absorbed and, and figured out? I think that um, coronavirus is going to have a profound impact on the global economy. And because of that, a profound uh, impact globally on health. Uh, I expect that it will 
um, arrest the progressive improvement in poverty reduction that has occurred. I think it's going to reverse that. So I think we'll see an increase in global poverty. I think this is a multi-year um, disaster that will play out. I'm particularly concerned about the earning power in low-income countries. And even if you don't have lockdowns, even if you just say, let people do what they want to do, but given the risks um, and given uh, People just aren't going to want to congregate. Who wants to go on a cruise ship now? Who wants to go to a crowded restaurant? And if you're not going to go on cruise ships, on restaurants and airplanes, then all of the people who are supported by those elements of the economy don't have a living. And so I I, I think that there's one side of this, which is how the epidemic is going to play out in terms of its direct impact on mortality. But the bigger impact seems to me the cascading consequences throughout the economy. I would, I mean, it's not an existential risk. I don't think we're all going to die. Of course not. Um, uh, This actually, uh, the vast majority of people who get infected are not going to die um, of coronavirus disease. Uh, So we will get through it. Um, I do believe it will change the way politicians think about the risk of infectious disease. There's sometimes a sense that, well, infectious disease has largely been licked. Let's work on injuries and uh, chronic diseases. But throughout all of human existence, infectious disease has been the leading cause of death. Um, not so much recently in the U.S., but throughout all of our history, yes, it's been infectious diseases. And the coronavirus outbreak illustrates that it continues to threaten us. And so I think this will change the priority given to this. And in my own field, epidemiology, I, this certainly increases interest. We have an enormous um, blossoming of interest in what we do, for example, among students at Stanford. So I think that will grow as well. well very good. Well, Steve, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work? Um, well, you can certainly um, look me up on uh, the Stanford website. Um, and uh, if you're really interested, dive into some of the papers that we write. Um, my group of collaborators um, continue to work aggressively on NEPA, on uh, communicable diseases, um, a, lot, a number of communicable diseases. And like all scientists, we publish our work. And so, uh, and so if people are interested, they can follow up there. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.